when you've collected them all, you can move on to the next level. Right, that's the scenario out of the way. What's the game like? Well, as you can see, Superplex is a puzzle game of some complexity. Although it's a lot simpler than it looks, it has 111 levels, and every one is a challenge. In fact, I have to tell you that the difficulty level is very high. Or is it just me? You have three chances to skip a level, so if you get to one you just can't seem to solve, you've got a way around it. It's joystick controlled, and it plays easily, both in feel and in learning, <laughs> so even a journalist can play it. There's no time limit, and you have an infinite amount of lives, but don't think that that makes it any easier. There's a special trick in designing a game that convinces you that one more try will crack it, and this one does it on every level. My only criticism is that maybe it's a little too hard, but this depends very much on whether you play it like I do or not. Superplex is a damned fine game. Sid Mir, designer of so many of Microphone's combat simulations, takes everything to a much larger scale and shows us how to build a better world in civilization. You are pitted against a variety of opposing nations in a race to build and strengthen your own colony. You begin the game somewhere on a small unexplored island. It's here you must mine, search, kill and learn as many skills as you can to take your barbaric race to an evolved military society capable of taking on all comers. As you grow, your world grows with you, and with it comes the danger. You're not the first settlers on the island, and there is no guarantee that the others are friendly. Agreeable tribes join you, but the enemy shoot to kill. On paper, the game sounds like Sim City. In practice, it is so much more. Mir has surpassed himself in terms of challenge and addictiveness. After all, who could resist a bash at world domination? One for the Hall of Fame. And here's a tip for Carver. For infinite lives, enter RJ Toon on the high score screen. Now, of course, this is very different to last month when we did tech as they're purely a development house. Storm are also software publishers. So they've probably got a lot more interesting stuff for us to look at. Now, one of the perks of being a programmer is you get your own arcade. Wouldn't you love one of these in your home? Of course, they're not the actual arcade cabinets. I mean, these high-quality units are hand-built, but uh, they serve their purpose. Now, there could be some stuff back here that we're not supposed to look at. Let's take a glance. No? Oh, maybe next month, eh? Let's have a look down here. Now, this is the nerve center of the sales curve. This is where all the hard work goes on. All the programming. Here they all are, busily working away on uh, the latest conversions. Over here we've got Double Dragon 3, 16-bit. Final Blow on ST. Double Dragon 3 on 8-bit. And Storm's newest, Big Run. But we're not interested in any of this. We don't want to see this. We want to see Indie Heat, which is down here. Ned and John, programmers of Indie Heat. Hello. How difficult is it to convert something like this? Something like Indie Heat? Well, well, I'm the graphics man for this one. And um, it was, for me, it was relatively easy compared to other things because we got the graphics from the arcade uh, company, a different machine. And they sent us lots of discs with uh, all the various tracks from the arcade machine in it like this. And uh, the only really difficult thing was doing it for the ST. The Amiga was all right because that's in 32 colours. 
with the ST, I had to change the colours down and remap the tracks uh, with Deluxe Paint 3, which is quite easy. But uh, the rest was up to John. I understand things weren't quite so easy for you, John. I mean, when comparing uh, something like this, how do you decide what stays in and what doesn't? Well, what I usually do is I play the arcade machine uh, until I almost know it inside out. And um, I have to then decide which parts of the game are important to the gameplay and which parts I can leave out without affecting the gameplay at all. Um, in the case of Indie Heat, I have to leave out the fifth car because it, it, it wasn't really important to the gameplay. Four, four cars are enough, but the fifth car would have made my game run too slowly. So that's, that's the kind of thing I have to do. Now, you might think it's a nightmare converting onto 16-bit. How do you think the 8-bit guys feel? So what is it like converting onto 8-bit? Well, usually with the graphics, what we do is we take the arcade graphics and um, convert them down to the 64 and touch them up. Like in the case of Indie Heat, we tried that, but it didn't look any good. So what I had to basically do was draw the graphics from scratch, and they turned out all right. And as far as programming goes, on, on an 8-bit machine, you can't hope to make it anything like the arcade original. So what you do is you write a program that plays like the original um, and looks more or less like the original. But in real terms, if you were to see the two side by side, the 8-bit game would be nothing like the arcade game. But it feels the same, and that's the important thing. Right. So we're taking a, a fully packed arcade machine like this, running onto 16-bit, 8-bit, <laughs> and even on the Game Boy. But none of this is impressive. Not when you got it on your watch like I have. See you later. Take that. Quick Magazine proudly presents the first in our occasional series of classics from the past. This month, we bring you the game that captured the world, Elite. Elite was the original space trading game, where you, in your Cobra Mark III spaceship, had to fly around the galaxy, trading to make money to buy weapons, and taking your rating from harmless through to Elite. The game follows two courses to success. First, you could trade your way around the galaxy, buying low, selling high, and basically being dull. The alternative is to bounty hunt, picking off space pirates wherever you find them.